First of all, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Sagar Jatani. I'm the president of Safe Bears. And tonight we're super excited to have Assistant DA Butch Ford joining us to talk about crime and punishment in Alameda County. Now, before I turn it over to Butch, I'd like to tell you just a little bit about Safe Bears. We're a parent-led nonprofit organization dedicated to making UC Berkeley safe for students. And we formed about three months ago. And in that short period of time, we've grown to 700 members in 57 countries around the world. We work closely with the UC Berkeley administration on specific ways to increase student safety, like getting the night shuttles back in service, getting a discounted Uber program in place for Cal students, constructing security fences around student residence halls and more. So to learn more about us and support the work we do, please sign up for our newsletter at safebears.org. And I'm gonna hand it over to Elena Salazar, our Safe Bears secretary with a couple of housekeeping items for tonight. Thank you, Sagar. Butch's presentation will take about an hour, but I promise you it's gonna be one of the fastest hours of your life. I had a chance to see it the other night in our practice session and it's fantastic. Um, after that, we'll have about a 30 minutes of Q&A, which we'll try to wrap up by 8.30 Pacific um, time. You can also ask a question whenever you like. Even while Butch is in the middle of the presentation, I will save it and share it with Butch during the questions and answers later. Just use the Q&A button on your Zoom controls. Um, you can see it right there. We'll try to get through as many questions as possible. You can also ask a question without having your name attached to it. Just select the Ask Anonymously setting when typing your question. I will then introduce your question as coming from one of the attendees without identifying you by name. We've enabled captions for the webinar. If you would like to see the captions, just use the Captions button in your Zoom controls and select your language of choice. Only you will see the captions if you choose to turn them on. We're also recording this evening and we'll send all tonight's attendees a link to it in a few days. Thanks. Thanks, Elena. You know, before Butch Ford served with distinction in the Alameda County DA's office, he was a UC Berkeley student. His kids spent a lot of their childhood playing basketball, riding bicycles in Berkeley, and more recently, Butch has prosecuted all manner of crimes that have taken place in Berkeley and other communities. So he's a man who knows Cal well. Butch served for many years in the Alameda County DA's office prosecuting complex, high-profile cases. His dedication to ensuring that victims of crime receive justice was recognized in 2019 when he was named Prosecutor of the Year by the California DA's Association. Now in May, Butch resigned his role as Deputy DA for Alameda County, writing an open letter to District Attorney Pamela Price in which he told her that she had abandoned the victims of crime through her misguided policies. I think you might hear a little bit more about that tonight. Butch now serves as assistant DA for the city of San Francisco, working alongside District Attorney Brooke Jenkins. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Butch Ford. Thank you everybody. And, and it's a pleasure and an honor to, for you to have me. I'm gonna jump right into the presentation uh, since I have share screen and please, please feel free to, to type in questions and, and I'm happy to answer all the questions that are necessary at the end. <clears throat> So let's get going. All right, I understand that the, the title was Crime and Pun Punishment in Alameda County, but I'm gonna be honest, seeing as I'm speaking to Berkeley parents, I'd rather talk about uh, UC Berkeley and safety. Uh, I think that, that's a more apropos topic to begin with, but I promise to cover crime and punishment in Alameda County. So, Obviously, as you heard, I went to Berkeley. It's always go blue, go bears. I have no uh, shame about that, uh, even with my friends who went to other schools uh, further south than here. <clears throat> I attended Berkeley from 1991 to 1995. Uh, it was the best time for me, uh, as college should be. But it wasn't a perfect four years. And what I mean by that is there is crime in every college community, every community uh, in, in the world. It, th that can't be denied, right? And a couple of anecdotes at, well, at my time at Berkeley to demonstrate that it wasn't perfect was I was an usher for the music department. And as a result, uh, I worked as an usher in Zellerbach Hall. If any of you have had the pleasure to be there, it's a beautiful, it's a beautiful environment to watch, to watch performances and things like that. But one day as I was an usher, uh, my house manager got into an argument with one of the patrons. The argument was whether or not the patron had a ticket to come back in. 
this event culminated with me asking the the patron, hey, just let me see your ticket and then we'll call it we'll call it a day. Well, he pulled a gun out on me in the middle of Zellerbach Hall during the, the intermission. I grew up in South Central LA, so I'm looking in his eyes thinking, is he really going to shoot me? And then I look down at the gun and think he does have a gun. And I looked in his eyes and thought, is he really going to shoot me? Then I looked down at the gun and said, he really has a gun. The last thought I had uh, after that was, my mom is going to kill me because I, I survived South Central and I get shot in the middle of Zellerbach. I wasn't shot because the police immediately jumped on both of us because they didn't know what was happening. They identified me as an usher, arrested him, and took a statement from me. Within a week, I was contacted by a deputy DA named Ann Diem, who talked to me through the process, explained what would have to, have to happen if I had to come to court, and just put me at ease in terms of what the process was. And, and I remember feeling, feeling the sense of there is somebody who is at least looking out for me as a, as a student, and I didn't do anything wrong, and the district attorney's office was kind enough to call me. Fast forward several years later, when I interviewed for the Alameda County District Attorney's Office, the first person I interviewed with was with Andy. So I always remember that uh, that sort of story as it made me feel good about, even though there was crime there. Another story, I was at the Greek theater. And at the Greek theater, there was a patron there who was just causing a ruckus. So I asked him to please take his seat. And he started threatening to shoot me. Didn't have a gun, but he was threatening to shoot me when UCPD immediately sprung on him, grabbed him, and took him away. Same process. I got contacted by another DA later on, and I just remember feeling like there was somebody looking out for me when I didn't understand the process. I then attended Loyola Law School from 1996 to 1999, and then I joined the Alameda County District Attorney's Office in 2000. I remember when I started, it was January 3rd of 2000. As Sagar indicated, that I recently gave notice and left the Alameda County District Attorney's Office, which I'm, I'm not gonna hide, hide it. It was sort of heartbreaking as it was the only job I really ever wanted to do. Um, but I've, I've landed in a good spot in San Francisco and I have a lot of respect for the DA there, Brooke Jenkins, and she is turning that office around. As I said, no system is perfect. Um, there, there is always gonna be crime, even under the best of circumstances. And in Alameda County in particular, there has always been a high incidence of crime and there's no way around that. It's just what has happened. And it's also why I've decided to practice in Alameda County for all these years as an Alameda County District Attorney. So this is sort of a case that some of you may know in our run through, we discussed it a little bit a couple of days ago. So this is Seth Smith. Seth Smith was murdered by Tony Walker. I was the DA who negotiated this case. So what that meant is his attorney came to me sort of made their pitch as to why this shouldn't be a murder. I said, oh no, this, this is a murder. And we had many, many negotiations. I say this as an example that the system isn't perfect because this happened in, in uh, I think the end of, I think it was in 2020. It happened in 2020, but I was responsible for negotiating the case. The, I did something unusual in this case after I talked to the victim's family, they wanted the case to be resolved they did not want to go through the hardship of a trial, and they didn't like the uncertainty of a trial. What I offered to, to do with, with them is I said, look, I can get him into the mid-20s as far as a deal, uh, but are you interested in trying to have him what, what we call allocute? We don't do that in California, but in New York, it happens. And they asked me to explain it to them. I explained it to them, and they said, we absolutely want that. We want him to try to explain what he did. And I said, okay. The way I will do it is I will not make him a deal unless he agrees to allocute. At the end of the process, he, he agreed to do it. His allocution wasn't, wasn't, it didn't provide all the answers the family wanted, but at least they got to hear him say something. And he apologized profusely. Whether it was sincere or not is a different issue. The reason why I use this case is because it's a terrible set of circumstances where this young man was, was targeted and had done nothing wrong. And this happened again a couple of years ago. But my job as the DA in this case was to decide what I thought was a just result and as well as keep the family in, 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 in the loop and take their, their feelings in, in, into consideration. At the end of this, this negotiation and we had an agreement, I know the family felt hurt. I know they felt hurt and I felt good about my ability to make sure they felt heard and they, they felt not good about the resolution. That's, that's the, the wrong word but felt satisfied that they got some form of justice. 
Tony Walker pled to 25 years. He was 62 at the time. And in my mind, when you're 62 and you plead to 25 years, I keep you away from hurting other people for as long as necessary. And so for me as the DA, I felt it was a good resolution short of trial. I believe it gave Seth's family everything they wanted. And of course, I also explained it to my supervisor at the time, my boss, who was Nancy O'Malley, who trusted me, and we came up with a good resolution. They also knew, we also knew that nothing was going to bring Seth back but at least I can give the family some closure. And that, that was my job as a DA in that particular case. <clears throat> What's happening right now in Alameda County, right? Particularly Berkeley is where I wanna start. All of these are taken directly from the headlines. You can find them very easily if you Google. I'm not advising you to Google at all because it is, the, the point of this is not to cause panic. It is the point is to give you some tools and some knowledge about what what is happening and perhaps what you can do and what you're already doing. As you can see from this headline, in Berkeley, crime is on the rise, right? It's the highest in the past 10 years. Violent crimes, which include homicides, rapes, robberies, and aggravated assaults, have increased by 25.2%. That also doesn't include the rise in, in sort of quality of life crimes like burglaries, auto thefts, things like that. Berkeley crime rates are rising in Berkeley, impacting UC students and staff. Of course, that's one of the concerns you all have. As you can see here, and let me move this window off the side of me. As you can see here, UC Berkeley is listed as first in unfounded crimes, which I thought was interesting, but more importantly, fourth highest in criminal offenses, six, six in violence against women, but only 21st, 21st in arrests. The same month that this article came out, a group of Cal students were filming a school project at 4th Street Shopping District and were robbed at gunpoint. I remember being aware of this when it happened, right? It's a, they're, they're doing a filming project and a car pulls up, four guys jump out with masks, wielding firearms and steal all of their property, which the estimate was $10,000 in filming equipment. It's something that nobody should go through, but particularly students who are just trying to do a, a school project. In another week that, in another incident that week, there is a barista and a student, a, a Cal student at a coffee shop where they get attacked by an unhoused individual. Now, that unfortunately is something that happens in Berkeley uh, and, in, and in other places. But this particular thing, individual, if you look down to the back, this man had been arrested 17 times by UCPD, including for a stabbing and had five separate misdemeanor convictions. The district attorney's office charged the man with two misdemeanor counts of battery. What does misdemeanor mean? that he will suffer almost no consequences as a result of this attack. This is also taken from the same article. Disturbing safety concerns also come from an attempted kidnapping. And Sagar was talking about something that just happened recently. This happened in, in late January next to campus in broad daylight, a very similar type crime where a man tried to grab a woman and threatened to sexually assault her. Video footage shows students attempting to avoid the man who seems to be harassing students by yelling and making erratic movement towards him. Now, I, I, I believe that as a DA, I'm more of the good, the bad, the ugly. It's a reference to an old Western movie that my dad made me watch when I was a kid. He didn't make me watch, but I watched it with my dad when I was a kid. The reality of this situation is lots of this has to do with a couple of factors. Oftentimes it's mental health. Sometimes it's, it's drug addiction. And oftentimes it's a combination of all three. But in Alameda County, we have always been aware of that. And we have been historically one of the most progressive DA's offices in, in the state. As crime rises, the Berkeley Police Department has seen a reduction in its force through fewer police officers. This article talked about how they have an allocation for 181 officers, but only have 150 officers. They need 181 officers to run what they believe is the safest patrol system that's available. But you'll see later on this presentation, Police agencies in, in the Bay Area, particularly in Alameda County, their numbers are extremely low. <clears throat> this is another incident where somebody was actually attacked on Lower Sproul Plaza and suffered facial injuries. Uh, a little more than two hours after that, there was another aggravated assault on Bancroft Way in Ellsworth. I paid attention to that because when I was at Cal, my junior and sophomore and senior year, my best friend, who some of you may have heard me speaking about, lived on Ellsworth just past Durant. And, and that was the way we would walk to the RSF. So I know exactly where this is. Also uh, on Duran and Ellsworth earlier in this month, 
there, there was a, earlier the month of this article, there was a reported anti-Asian hate crime where the attacker tried to hit the victim with several rocks. <laughs> this is another headline where freeway passengers driving by a Berkeley work crew, uh, right there, the main, the main thoroughfare through Berkeley and shoots at them. You'll see there are a lot of articles from a woman named Emily Raguso. She runs the Berkeley Scanner. I found that she does a really good job of, of thoroughly covering her stories. Uh, it's interesting because I had another reporter who I was talking to who said, her stories are so wordy, she needs an editor. And I, my, I responded and said, she is her editor, so she gets to have as wordy stories as she wants. And I appreciate the in-depth detail, in detail. This is Berkeley police recover Honda after a, car, after a carjacking on McGee. You can see this is from June of, of, of 2023, so not that long ago. Girlie charged with sexual battery at a Berkeley shop clerk. That's from June 7th. Brazen thieves take $52,000 in tech from Berkeley Apple store. That was May 29th of this year. Woman in her 70s is robbed by kids outside a police station. Police arrested a 12-year-old and several others. BPD also investigated an armed robbery and a carjacking near campus over the weekend. Here's what I want to uh, take a moment to talk about this. It's fairly, it's fairly well known that, especially in California, we don't like the idea of prosecuting juveniles. The problem is, again, Alameda County is one of the most liberal counties in the state, which means we're one of the most liberal counties in the United States. We don't prosecute juveniles in a way that you think, oh, we put them in jail, we, we lock them up in prison. What we do is we make them go to programs, we make them get counseling, things like that. Right now, for this case, I guarantee you this 12-year-old will suffer no consequences as this under the new DA. She is not charging any kids. So the kids just, it's catch and release. They go back out and they commit another crime. They go back out and commit another crime. But I wanted to stop and explain that in that these kids assault as a woman in her 70s. This is a map of Berkeley. If you guys are familiar with that, you can see Berkeley is up here outlined in the red dotted line. You see its proximity to Oakland, which I will discuss some more. The reality is the proximity to Oakland means that if I'm a Berkeley parent or my daughters go to Berkeley, I always ask them where they're going. And I, in my own mind, I figure out how close is that to Berkeley? And do I have to have more concerns because it's too close to Berkeley? I mean, I'm sorry, how close is this to Oakland? So I wanna talk a little bit about Oakland because what you're gonna see is lots of criminals from the surrounding cities go into Berkeley. And the reason they go into Berkeley is because students are there. Students with laptops, with cell phones, with money that their parents have sent them. So in 2023, Oakland is in the 35th position out of 425 ranked cities. And that's, that, that's from numbio.com. On this ranking, Oakland stands out as the sixth most, crim, crisp, sixth most criminal city in the United States. Its crime index of 68.83 is higher than that of Chicago, Philadelphia, and Milwaukee. I don't know a lot about Milwaukee, but I know a lot about Chicago and Philadelphia. And I was surprised that, that their index is higher than Chicago and Philadelphia. By the way, Philadelphia's crime rate is skyrocketing uh, right now and has been skyrocketing for the last couple of years. <laughs> this is a headline from, from another article uh, dealing with KTVU News, which is our channel too. They don't do anything. Oakland business is frustrated with police response to Berkeley search. Let me go back. That's from March 6th of this year. May 31st of this year. Rising Oakland crime draws fervent pleas for city action. Violence against women was a recurrent theme throughout the night. Women are being assaulted. Let's not sugarcoat this. So one of our one of the Oakland City Council members, Dan Cow, held like a town hall meeting. One of my friends who's a DA was present and was texting me and sent me the link. So I watched on Facebook Live. The people who were getting up and talking were so angry. They were yelling cussing, screaming at Dan Kalb saying, do something. You need to do something about this DA. Women are getting assaulted. A woman stood up and talked about how she had been attacked by a group of young men who all were teenagers and thrown on the ground, kicked and punched as they tried to take her purse and she refused to let go of her purse. So that happened basically May 30th. So as the article is May 31st. I'm gonna see if I can get this video played. This is every weekend in Oakland. And the video is two minutes long, but I think it's important. It's important to to uh, listen to the whole thing.
It was another weekend of dangerous sideshows on the streets of Oakland, and one of them turned violent. As KTVU's Henry Lee reports, a man was attacked after confronting people at one of those sideshows. Video posted on social media shows a man frustrated by a sideshow at 34th and Adeline in West Oakland. He hits one of the cars spinning donuts around him and is then attacked, punched, kicked repeatedly, even while lying on the ground. The victim appears to be unconscious. You can still hear tires screeching as he lies motionless on the sidewalk. At the same sideshow, this Mustang ran into and sheared off a fire hydrant. Nia Navarro, who's visiting Oakland from out of state, sympathizes with a man who tried to stop the mayhem. If he's fed up, he should speak up, right? But I personally, I just, I don't like to get involved with that. I don't recommend people get involved with that. And please do not, you know, interfere. Let the police officers respond to that effort. But for officers to respond, there has to be enough of them or else they'll be outnumbered. This video shows an Oakland officer driving slowly through a sideshow of dirt bikes and ATVs at 42nd and International in East Oakland. The officer takes off while being escorted away by bikers. Oakland City Council member Noel Gallo says he and residents are beyond frustrated. The council rejected his proposal to go after spectators. He's still trying to go after promoters and participants. Uh, we're not trying to criminalize. We're trying to protect the residents of Oakland. We're just trying to enforce the laws that we have and make it not only safe for the community, but also safe for the individuals that are involved in the sideshow. <laughs> Seems like no part of the city is immune. This video shows people caravanning in dirt bikes, ATVs, and cars on both sides of International. Here, cars and bikes at another sideshow took over Lakeshore and Hanover at the edge of Lake Merritt. And this sideshow took place at Fifth Avenue and East 10th Street. Oakland police on sideshow duty on Sunday made one arrest, recovered a gun, and towed two cars. Now, they may not be able to catch sideshow drivers immediately, but officers do show up with tow trucks weeks or months later, and those drivers are stuck with those impound fees. Henry Lee, KTVU, Fox 2 News. Oh. So the the import of that is those sideshows that they were showing were all in West Oakland. West Oakland is the essentially the closest tip of Oakland to Berkeley. This is a, a still of another sideshow where on Instagram, somebody films a sideshow going on, cars doing donuts, and the police just drive right through and drive right by. They don't even get out of their cars. So before I, I play this video, I want to give some context. First and foremost, I want to apologize about some of the language on this video. Secondly, this is a video of somebody at a Pamela Price rally. So people have been complaining about Ms. Price. So this individual is at the rally. You'll see him standing up on the up on the stage with people. And if you look at his shirt in the middle, it says Butch. They wore shirts against me, which I'll explain in a little bit. But what I want you to do is listen to what he said, and I'll give you some more information later in the presentation about, about who he is. Hey, folks, we got a voice now. We got Auntie Pam Price. She's listening to us. She's hearing us. I'm talking about I've been a victim. My brother up in there right now. All my brothers, free T-Roy, free Joe. Free DJ, free man, it's so many man. I got I answer call up every day from prison to prison, Santa Rita, every day, 713 number popping up. Because I'm talking to people that's in the system. You know what I'm talking about? So I'm out here trying to get my people out of the system. I have been a part of the system. I've been in the system my whole life. I'm talking about missed all my twenties in the system. Going to this courthouse, remember looking out the window, thinking like I could jump out the window and escape or something, trying to get up out of this motherfucker, figure out a way out of this motherfucker. Now I'm out here, and just the best thing I can do is come fight with my people. The best way we can fight is putting our voices together. You know what I'm talking about? Pam Price, she's speaking for us. She's speaking for all of us, not just me, not my brother. You might not even like my brother, but like what she doing, man, because she's she getting real motherfuckers back. People that ain't had no way. Like, man, I sat in the county for six years. They ain't listen to nothing. They ain't offer me no deals, none of that. But I ended up coming out good because I had some paper. I got a lawyer. Everybody ain't had no lawyer. Everybody couldn't get no lawyer to fight their shit or really fight for them. I had no mama. A lot of motherfuckers' mamas wouldn't fight for them. A lot of motherfuckers' mama didn't even know where to fight at. My mama fought for me. She fight for my brother. You know what I'm talking about? And we out here fighting, man. We're going to keep it lit. We keep them pushing. I'm talking about we fight for fast fights and stay up in here because we need people up in here like that. We need black jury. We need people that's a part of our environment. People that really relate to us, man. Huh? Yeah, how how a person gonna 
have empathy for me if they don't even understand me. They don't know where we come from. They don't know nothing. They don't they never seen a mama cry or feel how my mama feel like she raised a motherfucker wrong or something. She ain't raised us wrong. The system raised us wrong, man. That shit broke. I'm trying to fix it, I'm trying to get it together. So we out here, you know what I'm talking about? We gonna stay out here. We gonna stay motherfucker pushing the line and we our voice gonna be heard. You know what I'm talking about? I just came home. We got motherfuckers coming home left and right. And we're gonna keep fighting for people to come home, man. Because y'all breaking us taking us away from our family. That's my boy right there. He just came home. <laughs> he just did 12 years too. That's crazy. My boy, man. We was up in there talking about this shit though. Like coming together, man. Like, that's one thing we ain't did. We did everything else but come together. They gotta come together and get rich. Leave the monkey business behind. Nigga ain't no monkey, man. We're really too sophisticated. Man, we can do whatever we wanna do out here. We really king to this. So who is that? His name is Coleon Carroll. He was prosecuted by the Alameda County District Attorney's Office. He pled no contest to voluntary manslaughter in 2016. The case is from 2010. So when he says, I sat up in here for six years, he is correct. He, he sat in custody for six years, didn't ask for a speedy trial or anything, and ultimately took a deal on a case. He was the getaway driver in a murder and an attempted murder. So he and his buddy went driving around. He's the driver. And they end up shooting at people and kill one person and try to kill a second person. <clears throat> the driver and the shooter in that case is from Pittsburgh, California. Coleon Carroll is from Berkeley, West Berkeley to be specific. So when he says free Joe, he says free Joe, free cheap, free T Roy. Joe Carroll is his brother. His brother is currently charged with three murders and three attempted murders in Alameda County. So when he's saying Pam Price is speaking for us, he is saying he expects Pam Price to look out for his brother. Now, I, I point this case out because I, I hope everybody appreciates the reality that we have criminals and convicted murderers celebrating a DA whose job it is to, is to prosecute. But when he says free Joe, he is specifically talking about his brother. His brother, Joe Carroll, was a shot caller for a West Oakland waterfront gang. I mean, West Berkeley waterfront gang. So... He basically is, is currently in custody, and he believes he is going to be home soon because of DA Pamela Price. <clears throat> he says free T-Roy. He's talking about Troy Seals, but everybody calls him T-Roy. Everybody who knows him calls him T-Roy. Troy Seals of San Francisco was convicted of murdering DeAndre Adams. I was the prosecutor. I say that he's from San Francisco. Uh, Coleon was convicted of a case where he's rolling around with somebody from Pittsburgh, California. This is Troy Seals. What did Troy Seals do? Troy Seals got an assault rifle and shot up this green Honda Civic, killing the driver. This is a, a photo of where the driver was seated when the police arrived and took him out. He's not in the photo. I purposely did that. But he's shooting an assault rifle at DeAndre Adams. This is DeAndre Adams. What caused Troy Seals to kill DeAndre Adams? DeAndre Adams was in a, in a verbal dispute with another young man named Dupree Riley. And DeAndre Adams ended up breaking a window out of a car that Dupree Riley was driving. The car belonged to Troy Seals' girlfriend. And so Troy Seals comes, ac comes across the bay into West Oakland and ends up shooting DeAndre Adams and killing him. I prosecuted the case. Troy Seals wanted a speedy trial. So from the time he was charged to the time we were in trial was less than 90 days. Anybody who requests a speedy trial, that's the timetable. They can get to trial as quickly as 90 days. Troy Seals' case has also gone up on appeal, and, and they've made claims of prosecutorial misconduct and other, other such claims. The appellate court has said, no, nothing wrong, no misconduct, nothing. Your conviction is upheld. The reason why his family is over there protesting is because they are asking Pamela Price to recall his case and then change the sentence, even though he's already lost his appeal. So they believe she's going to do that. I told you that Berkeley is sort of a, a gathering of people, people from Richmond come into Oakland, come into Berkeley, and commit crimes. This was a very high-profile case where it's caught on surveillance footage. The blue arrow is pointing at a recently retired captain from the Oakland Police Department. He is stopped at this gas station, which is two minutes from the Oakland Police Department, to get gas when he is accosted by three people with guns. He gets involved in a shootout with these guys and ends up shooting the person in the red jacket who dies and... The guy who is over on the right by the other car, by the dark black car, he ends up shooting the officer multiple times so that they thought the officer was going to die. 
The officer's name is Ursi Joyner. He's one of the best officers I've ever met. And everybody was, was, was like on pins and needles thinking, is he going to make it? Is he going to make it? He now believes this case is still pending. He believes Pamela Price is going to release the individuals who try to rob him and try to charge him. I know that because I talk to Ursi fairly regularly. He believes that that is going to happen. Meanwhile, the defendants who tried to rob him and shoot him and he shot to defend himself, they believe it's going to happen. We also have people who come in from Vallejo into Berkeley, into Oakland and commit crimes. People who come in from Pittsburgh, as I indicated, Coleon Carroll, his friend was from Pittsburgh when they went and did the drive-by shooting and, and killed somebody. People don't realize it's all connected. Even juries, when we, when we impanel jurors, they don't know it's all connected. West Oakland has their own gang, which is the Waterfront Gang. As I said, Joe Carroll was the shot caller for that gang for many, many years until he's in custody. So Coleon Carroll, <clears throat> As I said, he, he's sitting there at a Pam Price rally celebrating, saying we are supporting the DA. When he says anti-Pam, that is what the criminals call DA Pamela Price. They all refer to her as anti-Pam. He says, and, and I didn't play it again, but what he says is, we are kings out here. Who is the we? The criminals. We are kings. He also says, we can do whatever we want out here. And this is at a pro Pamela Price rally, support Pamela Price, which is what you saw. The criminals all know this. They all do. Anybody who doesn't believe that is, has their head in the sand. Criminals know what's happening. They're, they're, they may not be the brightest in terms of book smart, but they are street savvy and they know what's happening in the criminal justice system. So the title of the presentation at the beginning was Crime and Punishment in Alameda County. So I want to give you some some indications of what's happening in Alameda County now. This is also a case I dealt with. I dealt with a lot, a lot of cases. So in this case, the defendant is driving around in Oakland with this, 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 uh, with their loved one. Defendant's driving around. He's shooting his gun off like in the air and just going crazy. They end up in Castro Valley and they're, they, I think it's in Hayward actually, they end up in Hayward and they're getting high. While they're getting high, the defendant is playing with the gun and he keeps jamming it in our victim's face. And our victim keeps saying, stop that, stop that. And he jams the gun in the victim's face and shoots him and kills him. I, I got involved in this case because the family was upset because there was a warrant outstanding for the defendant. It had been a year. Basically, he got, he got arrested, uh, got released because of COVID, failed to come back to court, and was living his life for a year and nobody had arrested him. The family contacted the district attorney's office. I set up a meeting immediately between me, the family, and the sheriff's department because it was their case. I promised that family I would do everything I could to get the killer of their, of their son in custody again. So through the district attorney's office and two inspectors who I trusted, I literally called them and said, hey, the sheriffs are having troubles with their resources. I need the both of you to get on this. I need, I need some bounty hunters. Two days later, he was in custody because of the efforts of the district attorney's office. He was in custody and he's charged with murder. In this case, Pamela Price decided she was going to reduce the charge to a involuntary manslaughter. She has no understanding what the law is. If you create a scenario where somebody could die because you're playing around with a gun and jamming it in somebody's face after shooting it off and you shoot them, the law says that is a murder. That is a murder. This family expected justice for, for their loved one, and now they're pissed because Pamela Price has ignored them and abandoned them. This is another case that has had a lot of high profile. Suspects in the Jasper Wu case won't face the possibility of life without the possibility of parole. The district attorney's office gets to make that decision. But here's, here's what I've told people that don't know what's happening inside the office. It doesn't matter what they're charged with. She is going to lower the, lower the deal. She's, she's set the bar already for what crime is worth in Alameda County, and the price of crime has plummeted in Alameda County. So while the news headlines are, oh, they may not get life without parole, the reality is, is they're going to get significantly less than that because of Pam Price's policies. This is another shooting of a, a five-year-old girl on the freeway. She and her family are headed to a party, a birthday party, when some gangsters mistake them for mistake somebody in the car for a gangster and start shooting at the car on the freeway and kill this little girl. She chose to not even charge any gun enhancements in this case, which all it means is when the case ultimately resolves on her watch, she's going to lessen it. 
And so the question becomes like, well, what can she do? This is another case, and I mentioned it a little bit when I was talking to Sagar, is it's a triple homicide, Delonzo Logwood, he's charged with murdering a witness in a case, a murder for hire, where somebody pays him to kill somebody, and a third murder that was personal to him. So initially, Pam Price makes her, her, her deputy DAs offer this person 15 years on a triple murder because she drove out the DA who was best equipped to handle the case, the DA who, had, who was most knowledgeable about the case. She drove that DA out. That DA is now in San Francisco. She then offers 15 years uh, to a person who we know killed three people. I'll come back to that case in a minute. This is another case where defendant, defendant breaks into these two brothers' home. There ends up being a fight. Defendant pulls out his gun. The younger brother runs and grabs a shotgun that they use for protection in the house. The older brother, who's a return missionary, snatches the shotgun from his brother and says, look, don't. this is not what we're going to do. Defendant shoots both of the brothers and kills them. Ms. Price offered the, the killer of these two brothers who broke into their homes nine years. Nine years for killing two brothers in their, in their home. Ms. Price is refusing to meet with victims. When I submitted my resignation letter, I said, you have abandoned victims because it's true. She doesn't meet with victims. She doesn't talk to them, which is why I started by talking about Seth Smith. There, there are always going to be difficult decisions to be made in cases, but at a minimum, the DA should meet with victims' families so at least they can feel heard and at least feel like they were part of the process. There are three components to, to the criminal justice system after the police do what they do, right? It's the district attorney, the defense attorney, and the judge, right? All three play a very critical role. What we have now in Alameda County is we have a defense attorney, a defense attorney, and a judge. District attorneys are not allowed to do their job and hold people accountable under Ms. Price. So what's happening now? The third component, which is the judges, the judges are now rejecting the DA deals. The master calendar department in Alameda County in Oakland is Department 11. The master calendar judge is a judge named Judge Caldwell. She has not even done heavy cases for that long, but she's a good judge. She is rejecting deals daily. So I want to go back to the Delonzo Logwood case. After she offered 15 years, the judge in that case, Judge Mark McCannon, rejected the deal. He basically threw it out and said, this is a terrible crime. I'm not accepting a 15-year deal unless you're able to articulate to me why it has to be done. Now, mind you, she had forced out the DA who, who was prepared to go to trial on the case. So she assigned it to a junior DA who knows nothing about the case. So for a three-week period, the judge is waiting for some indication from the DA as to why he should accept it. They show up, and there is no indication. The judge rejects the deal. Then Ms. Price tries to disqualify the judge. Basically, she has the ability to disqualify a judge if she, if she can indicate that he is not being fair. She basically said, he's not being fair. I want, to, I want to disqualify him. The good news is the mechanism by which she tried to do that meant a, a, a separate judge had to make the decision. The separate judge looked at it and said, this is absolutely falls short of the bar. You can't disqualify this judge. So Judge McCann was, was basically allowed to continue on that particular case. The issue for Judge McCannon is there is another mechanism by which she can challenge a judge where she doesn't have to make a showing, but she was so ignorant, she used the wrong mechanism, which meant a, a, a second judge had to make the decision. If she decides to challenge the judge on the, on the alternative method, there is no review. She can simply refuse to let him handle any criminal cases. So after it's made clear the judge has to stay on the case, she has her DA dismiss two of the three murder cases. The two mothers of those two murder victims refuse to have any communication with Pamela Price now. They refuse. They won't have any communication because they are so angry, so upset, and so sad. She then has her DA write out a memo that the third homicide case that Alonzo Logwood is facing is simply not provable. It's simply not provable. His lawyer also is like, none of these cases are provable except for years, I've seen the DA who had the case ask for a trial. Hey, judge, we're ready for trial, ready for trial. And I've seen the defense attorney say, no, no, we're not ready for trial. We can't do the trial. We can't do the trial because he knew that his client would be convicted. The end result is Alonzo Logwood pled to a deal on, on one count of voluntary manslaughter for 12 years. 
he will do two more years and he will be released from jail. The DA who handled that case for, for all those years, she and her husband would often go out into Oakland and eat in Oakland. She, will, she and her husband will never go out into Oakland again because the Lonzo Log will be back out on the streets very soon. And, and she told me, she's like, we can't go to Oakland anymore because he will try to kill me. So let's talk about the price of crime. Three murders for 12 years. That was the deal. Three murders, the lives of three people were worth 12 years. In the other case where the two brothers, the lives of two brothers were worth nine years. Here's another case that got a lot of, a lot of press recently. A group of teenagers goes around and the police, Oakland police have connected them to 35 separate robberies, many of which involve young, uh, or many of which involve older women where they brutally attack them, knock them down, hit them and assault them, right? You can see in the middle, the robberies included an attack on a 63 year old woman in Rockridge last Sunday. And the lack of punishment is prompting concerns and frustration from residents. These teenagers have never been charged. This is now a month old. They have not been charged and she will not charge them. Instead, she released a statement saying, oh, the investigation's ongoing, except the Oakland Police Department has said, the investigations are complete. We have ID witnesses. She will not charge them because they are teenagers. And again, whatever you feel about prosecuting teenagers as juveniles, not as adults, let's not even get to adults. Whatever you feel about them prosecuting them as teenagers, when you commit 35 robberies, there have to be some consequences. The kids, in that, the kids who, are, who are likely to commit these crimes, they now know there are no consequences. So robberies will continue. Eight juveniles, 35 robberies, mostly elderly women, no charges at all. And it's been at least a month since all of them were identified. Truth be told, these, are, these individuals were involved in robbing a woman I knew because she called me and told me what happened and said she had surveillance footage, which I directed the Oakland Police Department, I said, hey, I have a friend who lives over here. She was robbed. They have the surveillance footage. It's pretty clear that they're tied to these other groups. So they collected the footage from her. This is another case that demonstrates the price of crime in Alameda County. The blue line indicates an individual named Bernard Van Buren. You can't see the charges necessarily clear, but the short story of this case is he and three other people decide they're going to rob somebody right on the Berkeley-Oakland border. They roll up on these guys jump out with guns and try to rob them. One of the two people in the car were the victims tries to not tries to resist. And three of the four just start shooting into the car, striking both of them. Miracle of miracles. Neither of the victims die, but Bernard Van Buren is one of the defendants charged with, with shooting into the car, attempted robbery, great bodily injury, all the, all the enhancements. The district attorney, Pamela Price gave him a deal for essentially credit for time served. That happened in January, February, in March. In March, he got a deal where he got out of custody, where he and two of his buddies decided to shoot people while they tried to rob them. I, under, I, I highlight the name and blow it up so everybody is clear. Bernard Van Buren is his name. This, this event, this deal happened in March. This is from May. Two months later, he gets into, his, into an argument with his girlfriend in Oakland and tries to shoot her tries to shoot her. So this is what the price of crime is in Alameda County. And Berkeley is in Alameda County. We'll see what she does with this case. The reality, as I've said, is the criminals know who the DAs are and they know who the cops are. I can't tell you how many times defense attorneys would say, well, Butch, my, my client knows who you are. He's just asking what's the best deal he can get. Other DAs, the same thing. Hey, my client, my client knows the work you do. He look, he's willing to accept responsibility. He's just trying to get the best deal he can. And because we had serious prosecutors, seasoned veterans, real trial lawyers, we could keep the price of crime high, which ultimately, in my opinion, I can tell you, I've talked, I've talked to some, like I talked to a young man who I gave a deal to. He saw me on BART and I said, Hey, are you staying out of trouble? He's like, yeah, Butch, I don't want to see you anymore. So criminals know this. They know it. They also know when the police departments are depleted. So let's talk about that. Police departments. Understaffed at, understaffing at Berkeley is very well known. It's a severe staffing crisis, and that's according to the chief at the end of 2022. Oakland Police Department. Why, are, why is Oakland Police Department overwhelmed? It's because of staffing. They, they, they are low on staff. 
Also, the police under, under DA Price, they don't want to get out of their cars. You saw the video. They want to just drive by because they're afraid if we get out and something bad happens and we have to, and things go south, we're going to be charged with a crime. District Attorney's Office. All of this is, is, is Google, Google ready. More and more Alameda County prosecutors have quit because of Pamela Price. The top one is one of my friends. She's been a DA for three years longer than me. Uh, she's a woman of color who gave notice and wrote a letter basically saying, I, I can't work for you. You're not letting me protect people of color in these communities that I was once a part of. Um, Jill Narone, Caucasian woman, been a DA for 32 years. When I was a law when I was a law clerk, I watched her try a domestic violence murder case while she was eight months pregnant, and I remember thinking, "I want to be her when I grow up." So many, many DAs have left the office. There were 135 deputy DAs uh, as at the end of last year. Pamela Price wins; 30 have left. They've either retired early, quit, or gone to other district attorney's office. She placed seven on leave, including myself. The claim was that I was under investigation for prosecutorial misconduct. I had an interview with her chief assistant, and I said, how about this? Can you tell me what prosecutorial misconduct is? And he said, no, I have no idea, Butch. I said, can you tell me uh, what the standard of proof is going to be? I have no idea, Butch. Can you tell me when you expect I will have a hearing because I'm going to prevail because I've done nothing wrong? I have no idea, Butch. The short version is after that, after the meeting with her chief assistant, who's been a lawyer for a year, by the way. I walked out of the office and I decided that day I was going to give notice. I, I, they were never going to give me a hearing. They were never going to give me my due process rights, even though our union and our MOU mandate that it has to happen within a reasonable time. It just wasn't going to happen. And it was the only reason why I was hanging on is because I felt like I wanted some finding by an independent person to say I had done anything wrong because I'm stubborn. Meanwhile, from in custody, you've seen Joe Carroll from out of custody. And when I say in custody, trust me, through police sources, these are tweets being sent from in custody. We love and appreciate you so much. Thank you for everything at Pamela Price Cares. Them boys coming home. This is an in custody defendant who's charged with attempted murder. He's charged with attempted murder. And he is accessing the social media and singing Pamela Price's praises. I apologize for the language in here. I'm not going to state it. But they effed up and gave a real N-word another chance. Just got that deal Monday. We're going to see what these N's and B's been for the two years, hopefully on the same thing, because I'm pushing up on shit like monster trucks when I touch down. I'll translate. This individual is one of the co-defendants in, in the Van Buren guy. He's one of the dudes who shot the gun. He's talking about how he got a deal. He's been locked up for two years fighting his case. In other words, just keep continuing his case instead of asking for a trial. And he's saying, we're going to see what people out on the streets have been doing for the last two years, because when I get out, I'm going to start running people over like monster trucks. That's what he's saying. And again, these are in custody people. So here's the hopeful, the hopeful side. And I hope it's hopeful. It's a lot of doom and gloom, but there still is hope. I, I said this, I said this uh, in, our, in our warm up two days ago, and I said it well, before we started this. When I first was contacted and I saw that there was a group called Safe Bears, I was amazed. So as parents who care about your kids, you have a voice and you have two options. You can hear me roar, you can see the bear I used, or you can hear me whimper. And yes, I use UCLA on purpose, even though I have lots of friends who go to UCLA, but let's be honest, Bruins are a baby bear. I expect parents to roar because that's what I would do. My daughters are now 26 and 24. My 26-year-old is studying for the bar. My 24-year-old is studying for the LSAT after working for two years at a small insurance firm in Berkeley, literally a block away from campus. So I expect this, this group of parents to roar. So you've already, you've already organized and you need to prepare for what you can do. And it sounds like you guys are doing that, right? You know, who, you know the cages that you have to rattle. You know who you need to call, right? Your group, Safe Bears, has a voice. That's step one. You have to contact the Board of Regents about crime. You have to write them over and over. You have to call them over and over. Demand that they do something. Demand that they do something. Contact UCPD. Tell them, hey, what's happening? What's the staffing there? Do you have staffing issues? Then you boomerang that to the UC Regents and say, you need to step up the staffing at UCPD. Trust me, most of the police officers 
despite much of the terrible media, because there are bad cops, but most cops are just people trying to get home to their families and earn a living just like the rest of us. Contact Berkeley PD. Find out what's happening with them. Find out, do they have enough staffing? Because then you need to contact Berkeley city government. Um, I recently found out that Berkeley city government passed a, a or, or made an agreement to allow cameras to be installed in Berkeley, which they have refused to do. My understanding is that at least one or two of the parents at, on safe bears attended, attended virtually the, the, the discussion about that power to you. Berkeley city government, in the end, they have to be pressured just like any other government. Finally, believe it or not, contact DA Pamela Price. I don't know that she's going to listen. And in fact, she has stopped. She has refused to meet with families, but that doesn't mean you can't contact. You can't keep bugging. What's happening? Why are you not prosecuting crimes at, at UC Berkeley? Our kids are there. Our kids are there. By the way, she went to Berkeley School of Law when it was called Bolt. Right? But here's the reality. She has no experience at all in the criminal field. She, she ran as a civil, a civil rights attorney. What she really was, was a failed employment lawyer. But she claims it was civil rights. But she has no criminal experience. But you have to keep contacting her and bothering her because, again, you guys have a voice. She has chosen criminals over victims. You have to use your voice to make sure she understands that is unacceptable. It is unacceptable. The criminal justice system, no matter what anybody says, we are in California for a reason. One, we, we, we may not agree with all the politics, but we love what California stands for. That's why we live here, even though it costs so much, which is also an indication that we love living here, right? But the criminal justice system, particularly in California, is designed to protect one person's rights, the defendant. It absolutely is, and, and, I, and I'm proud to be a part of the system because my job has been to make sure that everybody's rights are upheld, including the defendants. But the criminal justice system is designed to protect the criminal's rights, not the victims. But you have a voice to help protect victims, to make sure victims' rights are advocated for because there is a Victim Bill of Rights. Pamela Price has ignored that Victim Bill of Rights. They have a right to have a say. They have a right to be heard. They have a right to be informed of what's happening with cases. Pamela Price is not doing that. But the more and more people who, I'm going to use the word harass because that's what it's going to take. The more and more people who harass her, maybe she'll change her policies. I don't believe it. She has started the few meetings she's had with victims. She has started by saying, you need to understand I've been given a mandate. And anybody I've ever heard repeatedly say they have a mandate, there's something not quite right. But that's what she does. Right? She's abandoned the community. But the way to try to get her to course correct is to complain to her. I'm going to be honest. I don't think it's going to matter. But you have a voice. Use your voice. So is there any good news? I told you the hope is that we have some kind of good news. Is there good news? The progressive DA in St. Louis, that, that project failed and she stepped down. The progressive DA in Boston, that project failed and she stepped down. Progressive DA in Chicago, after two terms said, I'm not running. I'm not running. Pamela Price is currently on a six-year term. Because of her age, I don't believe she's, she'll be able to run again, but six years is a long time and there could be a lot of damage. This, this experiment also failed in San Francisco, and many of you may know about that, Chesa Boudin, who came in as a progressive, got elected, said that they were going to remedy all the historical ills. I kind of scratch my head when I hear this because I think we're not in Texas, we're not in Louisiana, we're not in, in even Florida. We're in California, we're, and we're in the most liberal part of California. So trying to fix the ills, the historical ills in San Francisco or the historical failures in Alameda County doesn't seem productive to me, but what do I know? More potential good news. Our community is angry. I can't tell you how many times I get contacted by reporters. I get, I, I never answer call. I, I, I didn't used to answer calls that I didn't recognize the number, but because I've been contacted by so many victims families because they figured out they know me or they, they knew of me or they've seen my resignation letter, I answer all of them. I answer all of them and try to give them some, some little piece of hope but the community is angry. The complaints are getting louder. I am asking you as a group and as individuals to join your voices to those complaints. Maybe, maybe she'll listen. I don't know. But, but sooner or later, the, the volume has to be listened to. And then finally, the R word. More and more, there is a discussion about a recall. Um, I actually have lots of information on that. If anybody has any specific questions, I'm happy to answer those questions. Um, what I will tell you is it is much, much closer 
than Pamela Price believes. She met with the victims group a couple of months ago, led by a woman named Brenda Grisham, who has been very uh, adamant about Pamela Price's policies adversely affecting her community. Her son it was murdered, and it's an unsolved crime, which I feel terrible for her. But she's been really adamant. But at this meeting, Pam Price looked at these victims, talked about how she had a mandate, and they needed to accept it, and that there would be no recall. Ms. Grisham was very, very upset by that, and she is one of the voices who wants to drive the recall. But like I said, good news is I expect there's going to be a, an announcement, not in the too distant future, um, but I'm not here to be a politician. I'm here to be uh, someone who provides information for you, for everybody on this call. I want to end with this with this case again because I, I started by talking about it, and again, it is it is in my mind one of the most tragic things that could happen to a parent who has sent their child to college. And having sent my daughters to college, I at some level I believe, okay, we've made it. We've got our kid to college. They've survived up to up to high school. We can't we can't take that position anymore. We have to extend, and it's not even we have to, because we all do it anyway, but we have to maintain our vigilance, ask our kids to maintain their vigilance. My daughters write BART periodically. I don't like it. I hate it. It drives me nuts. It freaks me out. But I remind them, please be vigilant. Please take part with friends and in groups because they're safety in numbers. But I end with this case because as tragic as this situation was, this is how the system is supposed to work in Alameda County. The victim's families, Seth's families are supposed to be a part of it. They're supposed to be able to meet with the DA. And I was the supervisor. So I met with every family when I was a supervisor. Every family on every violent crime, I would meet with them and talk to them and introduce myself and say, if you have any questions, please contact me. It's the way the system is supposed to work. It's not working that way. Whatever Pamela Price's policies are, she's entitled to have those policies. She won the election. She is the current DA, at least for now. But you cannot, ab you cannot abandon victims. And I didn't, I didn't leave because of the policies. I left because she was lying to victims, ignoring victims, and not taking their, their, their emotions, thoughts, and opinions in, into consideration. And I, when I would meet with the victims' families, I would tell them, you guys get a vote. I am ultimately the decision maker because I'm the DA, but I want you to know you have a vote, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk it out and hash out any concerns you may have. So ultimately, that's why I left, is we cannot just ignore victims in a bad them. And that, that was the straw for me. Like, I, I can't do it. I can't do it. All right. Let's see. Now we are in the phase. My presentation is done, and I will point out it was less than an hour. I had 86 slides, by the way, but I knew I would get through in less than an hour. So please, um, I'm open to questions uh, about anything that you've heard, or, it, or if you've heard something recently, if I have information about that, I'll give it to you as well. Thank you so much, Butch. Um, reminder for our attendees, if you have a question for Butch, use the Q&A button to type in your question and we're gonna to try to get through as many of those as possible. Um, Butch, we do have uh, quite a few questions. We're gonna start with one from Kristen. She would like to know some of the top things our Cal students can do to protect themselves. Yes, very good question. Same, same advice I give my daughter is be vigilant, travel, travel in groups. Another thing that students do, and I did this when I was a student, I don't know, I, I expect some of you parents, or if not most of you remember this, when you get to college, you sort of think you're grown, if you will, I can do anything. Like I, I walked, I walked uh, a mile and a half at one o'clock in the morning when I was a, a student at Cal, because I was hanging out with some buddies. I'm like, oh, it's late. I got to go home. The buses weren't running. So I walked. Luckily now there's Uber. Take Uber take over, use the resources, stay in well-lit areas. And finally, don't get so, I'm just going to say it, don't get so intoxicated that you are not aware of your surroundings. And, and if you hear something, I, I would describe it as this. I would hear my mom's voice or my grandmother's voice in my ear saying, something's not right, it's time to go. Tell your kids to listen to that voice. If they hear your, their parent's voice saying something doesn't seem right, take steps to, to leave the area, get out of the area. Right. So it's it's common sense stuff, but when you're a college student, as you all know, sometimes you abandon common sense. So simple things, take Uber, travel in packs, no need to be staying out at one o'clock in the morning unless you're going to catch an Uber or you have a, a designated driver who's going to get everybody together. Be, be cognizant of where you are and who else is there. 
if there are, if there is a group of people who seem a little bit hostile, it's time to leave. Don't don't think eh, nothing's going to happen. It's better to be safe and saying mm, we can come back another day. Great. Um, we all, we have some um, other questions about. Um, let's see. Somebody was at, well, we have several Pamela Price <laughs> questions. So we're going to save that for the end. Someone okay. in the comments asked, what are unfounded crimes? So unfounded crimes is are crimes that there's a complaint and, and unfounded, initially unfounded. When I read it, I was like, crimes that are lies. That's not necessarily true. It's also crimes that they can't prove happened. So it's it's one person who says, hey, um, I, I lost my wallet. I want to report a theft. And the police show up and they say, well, I was drinking last night. And, and when I got home, I didn't have my wallet. So unfounded is crimes that can't be proven or crimes that are false in, in, in nature. So they cover both categories. Gotcha. OK, um, we we chatted about this um, briefly, but um, USC has a patrol and response areas that have been designated by the city attorney's office as a safe zone. Um, the safe zone designation provides for enhanced sentencing and penalties for those arrested and convicted of crimes committed on campus and campus adjacent. Do you see a scenario in which that could happen at UC Berkeley? I do see a scenario where it could happen, not in this DA regime, because even if there was enhancements, she is not charging enhancements. She has said she's, she refuses to do it. But again, the way you started is I would contact, I would contact, find out if there's an SC, if there's an SC group similar to Safe Bears, figure out what their process, if they had any involvement in it. But again, it, it's, it's about the tree that we decided, right? You go through the UC Regents and say, we want to establish this. Uh, and then you have to talk to legislators. Legislators, I would figure out who the local legislators are for Berkeley and say, we, we are demanding that you, you propose this legislation. So it would have to go through legislation for for a sort of a, a criminal enhancement. It couldn't just be it couldn't just be UC Berkeley saying, "Oh, we're going to create this zone." You have to go through the legislation to get it enacted. Okay, um, thank you. So another question that we have is that um, can you tell us the difference between how criminals are prosecuted in San Francisco versus Alameda County? Yes. So they're they're. So when I when I was running the felony trial team in Oakland, my grandmother would would the running joke was her. She's like, "Oh, you set the price of crime. You set the price of crime in Oakland because I was the one who decided what the value of cases were." And the DA at the time, Nancy O'Malley, assigned me to do that because of the experience I had in trials and otherwise. So the main difference between the two is under under Brooke Jenkins now it has gone back to a more traditional uh, uh, district attorney's office. And by traditional, I don't mean big picture traditional, I mean Bay Area traditional. And the easy example I can give is, is from my own experience, I always, I always describe myself as, as a DA of this type. If you've committed a quality of life crime and there's something going on, whether it's alcohol, drugs, mental health, whatever it may be, I'm the DA you want because I'm going to be open to facilitating you getting the help you need. If you're a veteran and you have PTSD, I'm going to facilitate getting you the help you need. However, if you have robbed, raped, or murdered somebody, I'm not the DA you want. When it comes to those crimes, I'm extremely conservative. My job at that point, and, and I have no problem saying this, I, I don't believe prison is about rehabilitation, and I've never been concerned about that, but I have a, I have a story I'll come back to in a moment. My focus on the crimes that I've handled for most of my career are murders. And at that point, my, my, my assignment, if you will, is to keep our public, our community safe by putting those people and keep, keeping them away from my community because I need my daughters to be able to be safe. And this person has already indicated a willingness to kill somebody. I want to go back to the rehabilitation thing. I have a cousin who was convicted of attempted murder when he was 19, sentenced to 17 to life. Periodically, he would call me from prison, even as I was a DA, because he had an illegal cell phone. But I would always take the call because I, I knew it was from a general area code. But I say, hey, are you okay? Are, are, are you need anything? He got out after 22 years. The whole time, he programmed, rehabilitated. That was that was 10 years ago, I think. He's married. He's married now, and he's married now, and and has a kid and has a job. So he rehabilitated in prison, and he'll tell you. He's like, no, no, I needed to be there because I made stupid decisions, but I learned and bettered myself. 
So I know it's possible, but I also don't believe that it's that's the primary focus of jail, particularly for cases that I've handled. Okay, thank you. We also have a question that says, how can we best support B, best support BPD in bringing safety to campus area and the city at large? By contacting the Berkeley city government, the Berkeley local government. It is, I, I love Berkeley for many things. When I was a Cal student, we marched and protested and all that stuff too. But Berkeley city government, they, they also kind of believe they have a mandate to be ultra liberal, which means kind of anti-cop. So you, you, it, again, there are so many Berkeley students. I hope that your group grows and grows and grows so that it becomes a deluge of phone calls, emails, complaints to city government to, to support the police. Gotcha. Okay. So we have, like I said, several questions about Pamela Price. Um, it just comes down to this. Um, is there an effort, an official recall effort aimed at replacing DA Pamela Price? If so, by whom and when? And this person um, who's not able to attend tonight wants to know how they can volunteer to collect signatures. Okay. So the answer is yes, there is an official uh, movement. There's a committee that is involved in, in going through the steps. And I'll give, you, I'll give you an example of some of the committee's work. The initial, the initial belief was that in order to get a recall on the ballot, they would need 93,000 certified signatures. The reality is you have to have at least 15% over that because many of the signatures get decertified. But 93,000 was, was the, 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 what was believed to be the minimum. This committee has figured out that that's not correct. It is actually 73,000. So like everything political, it takes money. So having to collect 20,000 signatures means it is cheaper than collecting 93,000. So there, I tell you that to sort of give you insight that it is official and that the committee has done its research and that I expect very, very soon that there will be an announcement. Uh, finally, the question was, how do you, how do you volunteer? How do you support? That's easy. When the announcement is made, there will be there will be a website or or a a committee that you can reach out to and contact. Um, I'm happy to provide my information as well because I I will be connected in many ways. Um, I will provide my information to Safe Bear so that if anybody want wants to to help in any way, I'm happy I'm happy to have them help. And again, I I've never been into politics. I just wanted to do my job, and unfortunately. Because of what's happening, I have to be a little political in terms of trying to to protect my community. And by the way, I I know a lot of people complain that police officers don't live in the jurisdictions they work. I live in Alameda County. I live in San Leandro, which is in the middle of Hayward and Oakland. And Hayward and Oakland are the two largest sort of producers of crime, if you will, in Alameda County. But I'm a resident. I've raised my daughters here. I expect my daughters will live here for most of their lives. Thank you so much for that. Um, so, you know, we have to touch on this. Um, we have a question about systematic racism. In your yes. opinion, what's the best way for the DA's office to address that? So it, it really is one case at a time. Uh, it, it, it's there. It should be no surprise since I'm on video. I've never looked at a case and thought, well, it's a white guy, so he gets a better deal. It's a black guy, he gets a, he gets a, he gets a worse deal. I've never done that, it's never crossed my mind. For me, it's always been about what the conduct was. Now, that being said, I can tell you that Alameda County DA's office, if I ever saw anybody who I thought was doing something that was based on race, I would flip out, I would immediately run it up the chain. It's not how we're trained in Alameda County. And when I say we're trained, I've been responsible for a significant amount of the training in Alameda County for the last 10 years. Now, in terms of the bigger picture for systematic racism, that's, that's a much deeper conversation. I think it's very tied to socioeconomics at this point, um, but I will tell you this. Having lived in Alameda County since I was 18, having been a part of the community since way before that, I know that the biggest two sources of crime in, in Alameda County come from East Oakland and West Oakland. It's not even in dispute. Those are the biggest sources of crime. The largest, the largest uh, racial population in both of those communities are African American. But here's the reality: 99, 99 point whatever percent of people in East Oakland and in West Oakland are law-abiding citizens. They absolutely are. They go to work. They struggle. They pay their bills. They raise their families the best they can. There's a very small percentage of people who are committing the crimes, and they repeat the, these crimes and do the crimes. So, what are what what is the way that the Alameda County uh, addresses it? 
We have talked for a long time about having blind charging to, to try to combat uh, implicit bias. We've gone through implicit bias training over and over and over. Uh, every other year, they make us do implicit bias training as well as they test us for it. But in my opinion, the shortest way that the, the DA's office can address it is by having blind charging. That's gonna require a lot of uh, investment from the police agencies because they actually document all this stuff based on, on their arrests because they're required to keep statistics as well. And then we would essentially have to tell them we need you to redact it. So we need them to sign up for it. But as, a, as the district attorney's office itself, that in my mind would be one of the, the easy, quote unquote, easy ways to start addressing it. But in terms of historic racism, I, I'm, I'm like most people. It's, it's, I don't know that there is an absolute solution, but what I do know is we have to, we have to work harder to get better. Okay, thank you, Butch. What solutions, options do we have to stop criminals from visiting Berkeley and committing crimes? So it's, I was involved in a, another discussion about that. And one of, the, one of the people in that discussion said, we need to put license plate readers. We need to put license plate readers on, on in, in throughout Berkeley. The problem is most of the criminals are committing crimes in stolen cars. So the license plate readers don't do very much. So what solution do we have to, to help prevent crime? I'm going to be honest, is it is, it is a more traditional approach to serious crime, they, that there has to be a message sent that if you come into Berkeley, you're going to be prosecuted. If you're, if, you're treating, if you're treating our students at Berkeley like they're lambs and you're the wolves, we're going to do everything we can to keep you away for as long as we can when you're committing violent crimes. That is the solution. When I say that the criminals all know, they all know, and I've listened to thousands of hours of jail calls where criminals are talking about what's happening with each other's cases, who the DAs are, who the police are, who the judges are, they know, they know. So it, it, again, it'll never, all, it'll never go away completely. There's just no way to do it. But to minimize crime is to, is to take steps, preventative measures, like, like putting up, like in San Francisco, I will tell you this, I'm assi I've been assigned 12 homicide cases. The first six I've reviewed are all on video. There are cameras everywhere in San Francisco. I, I was shocked. I'm like, I, you guys have all these cases on video? They're all on video. But there are no cameras in Berkeley. So that's, that's another way, right? When you walk in, you say, smile, you're on candid camera. That, that's another way to decrease crime. But Berkeley is very anti-Big Brother, and I understand. Thank you. Uh, Sagar, would you like to jump in and ask a few questions? Yeah, thanks, Elena. Butch, thank you, first of all, so much for that insightful presentation. Um, over the past few days, a couple of Safe Barriers supporters have emailed their questions into us, knowing that they might have a conflict and be unable to attend tonight. Um, one of them has to do with um, nation nationwide efforts to reimagine policing. You spoke about this a little bit a moment ago, but you know, in the wake of George Floyd's murder, the Berkeley City Council voted to reimagine policing, and that included a goal of defunding the Berkeley police to the tune of around 50%. So my question is, or the question from the original uh, poster was, are cities like Berkeley now starting to realize that they may have swung too far away from public safety? Are you seeing any evidence of that? You talked about some of the progressive DAs around the nation. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yes, abs absolutely, right? It's... It we talk about how we're trying to to reimagine policing, fix policing. The the reality is any system that is is run by human beings are going to have flaws, right? And I watched I watched the George Floyd video and my immediate thought was I'd prosecute the hell out of that guy. I would prosecute the hell out of him. I will give you some insight into that case though. He was charged with felony murder in that jurisdiction. In a California, he would never be convicted of murder. In that jurisdiction, Felony murder is much broader so that any, any assaultive felony can be the basis for felony murder. In California, it is a very small list of, of crimes that can be the basis for felony murder. So I thought, I thought it was ironic that in California, where we are very liberal we were, we, we, and we were very angry, justifiably so, I realized as a DA he would not be convicted of murder in, in, in California because the law is much more constricted because we are more conservative. Um, but in terms of, I think more and more people are realizing that the defund the police push was not the right move either. And, and it, again, it goes, it, it goes back to common sense. 
police need more training. I also think that we need more police officers and, and we have to make them work less hours. Um, just the, 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 the number of hours that officers are working to compensate for the, the, the lack of, of their roster is a problem. We, everybody's human, sooner or later people crack. I've also watched hundreds of hours of police responding to crime scenes, particularly in Oakland, where the people who are on scene trying to support the victim are just going off and screaming at the police, yelling and cussing them out. And I watch and I think, this is how these officers get PTSD. They start to, they start to dehumanize the people who are screaming at them because they feel dehumanized. So I think that we need to do a better job of, of making sure officers aren't overworked and minimize hours, similar to, to truck drivers. Truck drivers, even though it's not the best system, they're only allowed to drive uh, by regulation for a certain number of hours. I think that that has to happen. I think our police need better training. I think our police need regular sort of psyche vows, if you will, to, to, mm -hmm. to check on their mental health. I think, I think those are all good starting points. Great. Thank you. I'm going to combine two different questions here into one because they're very similar. Um, one question had to do with uh, expressing some frustration at the current policy, which appears to be a version of catch and release. You talked about this during your presentation. Uh, but the other question was, in your experience, have you seen an unwillingness on the part of police agencies to even arrest certain types of criminals because the police know that, hey, they're just gonna be back on the street in a, in a day or two? Yes, so I'll give you an example that, that was in San Francisco before I got there, but I had been in San Francisco enough to actually see what was happening. And I have a friend who's a San Francisco police officer. They were not getting out of their cars under Chester Boudin. They were driving by what we would describe as an open air drug market where people are selling drugs and doing drugs right there as children are walking by. And I mean like crack pipe, crack, smoking, smoking right there on the street. But it was it was a bigger issue in that at the time, the local government was like, well, you know, this is what our this is, we have to be more liberal. We have to, we're a sanctuary city, all these things, right? We, we have to we have to we have to make these more progressive rules. But as crime started to increase, as people started to complain, as groups such as Safe Bear started to come forward and say, what are you doing? We, we're, people are leaving the city. Our property values are dropping. The the local government shifted. They shifted and said, yes, we did. This is not what we intended. We did not want this to happen now. Police officers are getting out of their cars because there's a new DA in town who's like, no, and the, and the local government has shifted to say, look, the, the so-called progressive approach wasn't approaching, wasn't working. Our community is suffering and, and the, the constituents are suffering. So now there's, there's a, a bigger push towards what I would call the broken windows theory. Uh, and if you go back, if you think about the map that I had up, there's a, there's, a, there's a small city called Piedmont, which is surrounded by Oakland. Crime in Piedmont is very, very low, which is interesting in that obviously that it is an affluent area and the people who live there usually have a lot of money, but it is surrounded by Oakland. But the Oakland criminal element, if you will, they stay mm -hmm. out of Piedmont because the Piedmont police will stop them for having a cracked windshield. They will stop them for driving around with all tinted windows. They will stop them for driving 27 miles an hour. They will stop them for driving with loud music. So. The, the worst of the criminal element is like, stay out of Piedmont, we'll just hunt in Berkeley or we'll hunt in Oakland. Hmm. Gotcha. You know, one of our um, attendees tonight posted a question uh, asking, is there any mechanism for the California State Attorney General to intervene with the Oakland DA's office? I, guess, I think that's probably compared to say the recall effort, which you mentioned a moment ago. Yes, there is no mechanism. The only, the only way that the, the attorney general would get involved is if there was some evidence or proof of misconduct or misappropriation or unlawful conduct. That would be the only way that the attorney general would get involved. The attorney general will not do anything. And I, I have seen, I follow social media. I have no social media profiles, believe it or not, but I check in on social media and, and, and see comments where people are like, why, why isn't Rob Bonta doing anything? He's from Alameda. Why isn't the attorney general doing anything? There is no mechanism for the attorney general to do anything. The only mechanism for change as it stands now is what happened in San Francisco, which is a recall. Got it. Thank you. Um, another question that came in previously has to do with the role of tech. And I think you spoke a little bit about this with regard to the um, license plate readers a moment ago. You know, the Berkeley City Council, as you noted, recently allowed the police to install fixed intersection cameras 
at key points around Berkeley. Based on your experience, um, it sounds like a significant amount of the violent crime happening in Berkeley is committed by folks coming in from yes. surrounding communities. So what's the role, like, especially given the lack of uh, police staffing, what's the role of technology in this, uh, whether it's license plate scanners or intersection cameras or drones? Well, it, it, the, it's a vital role. And that's why I gave the example of San Francisco, where the first six homicide cases I have show that, that everything's on video. Now, the reality is most criminals don't commit crimes where there are cameras, right? They, unless, unless it's like a spur of the moment flash crime, right? Most, most criminals are smart enough to be like, oh, I'm on camera with everything, right? I'll give you another example that is on the other side of the spectrum. More and more over the last several years, so now that's norm is when a, when a police officer is arresting somebody, you see people pull out their cameras and they're filming like, I'm going to see if you do anything wrong. If everybody in our community did that, crime would disappear, but everybody's not going to do that. So the next best thing is by having cameras installed in, in what we would call a higher crime rate. If I were Berkeley, I put cameras everywhere. I'm on campus. I would put cameras everywhere and put signs that say, essentially, like I said, as a joke, smile, you're on camera right? That is a deterrent. License plate readers, even though I would say most of the crime is being committed in stolen cars, that still also will help solve crimes. And ultimately, when the when crimes are being solved, when, when criminals are being held accountable, that is how you suppress other people from coming in, which is why criminals don't go to Piedmont and criminals stay out of Alameda, Alameda proper, which is an island. They, I, I'm, I'm not joking. Given their proximity to Oakland, the real question is, why is crime not spilling over into those locations? Because they have cameras, because they have law enforcement, because they stop people for, like I said, the broken windows aspect. Mm -hmm. Berkeley, Berkeley has always been on the other end of the spectrum is we're going to protect individual rights, which, which I, I respect. But as a result, people know that they can go and prey upon kids in Berkeley. Mm -hmm. Um, another question, which we got a couple of parents have asked this over the past few weeks in our private discussion group, we've been watching with a lot of interest some of the steps being taken to uh, get a grip on crime in San Francisco um, by the district attorney and by the mayor. However, one of the concerns is as uh, life gets tougher for criminals in San Francisco, is there a risk that some of those actors are simply going to you know, make a trip across the bay into the East Bay community where our kids go to school? There's a reason why uh, all of your kids are at Cal because the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. That is absolutely true. And that was part of the theme that I showed is that that not only are the criminals interconnected, but they they have no problem crossing the bridge. And and again, the as as crime becomes more acceptable in the East Bay, criminals in San Francisco will travel across. As crime becomes less acceptable in San Francisco, and and I can tell you. There are lots of dedicated prosecutors who are who are good people and who want to do what's right and fix what what the, the damage that Chesa caused. But as crime as crime is being more and more punished and the police are feeling are feeling more and more confident in their work with the DAs, they will they will work harder to solve crimes, right? As opposed to, look, I've been at it for I've been at it for eight hours, my shift is over, I'm gonna go home. The the as the relationship gets better and better, they'll say, no, no, I'm, I'm going to do my work because I know the DAs are going to take care of it when it gets to them. So yes, that is, that is absolutely a concern I would have if I were, if I were, were you thinking about this? Yes. Great. Thank you. Dr. and Butch, um, we had a request for Butch to stop sharing his PowerPoint so that they could see him in the middle of the screen. Yes, no problem. Let me get out of that. I've Thank you. Okay, I stopped sharing. Right. You know, we got another question over the Q&A chat here, um, which I think upon reading this is probably more for us, Elena, than for Butch. Uh, what tips, the question reads, what tips do you have for local Berkeley residents who would like to partner with Safe Bears because we also care about local safety? And they mention sites like Nextdoor, um, where people are, are looking for something constructive to do. Um, from the Safe Bears side, I can tell you, we would absolutely love to partner with you. Um, you can find our contact information on our website, safebears.org, or you can just email me at sagar at safebears.org. Um, we, we've already made uh, some really important relationships with members of the local business community, with certain residents there, but we're always looking to do more because as Butch mentioned several times tonight, you know, there's, there's strength in numbers. And we know that 
although our main focus is the safety of our students, our family who are there, um, you know, we share the concerns about violent crime with many, many residents in the city of Berkeley. Um, so I look forward to hearing from you, from you and to, to working with you. By, by the way, by the way, I, I'm pretty sure that the the founder of Next Door is a Berkeley grad. Oh, interesting. That wouldn't yeah. surprise me. He went he went to school with me. I'm I'm 99% sure it's him. <laughs> That's wonderful. Well, Butch, listen, I want to thank you for sharing the wealth of your experience with us tonight. I have no doubt you're going to make an incredible impact in your new role as assistant DA of San Francisco. And I think I speak for a lot of us here tonight when I say we appreciate all your work on behalf of crime victims throughout the Bay Area. Um, I would also like to thank all of our attendees for spending your Wednesday evening with us. If you'd like to learn more about how we can make Berkeley safe for our students, I invite you to sign up at safebears.org. You'll get an email back right away, which describes a number of ways you can support our work. Uh, thank you again, Butch. And thank you, everybody, for joining. And if, go Bears. If I can, Cigar, the last thing I'll say is I'll be in touch with you when the recall gets up and official, and, and I'll make sure that I reach out to, to you so that you can make sure parents who really want to get involved have that access and that opportunity, because it's going to take everybody. Everybody's going to have to be involved to make sure we're successful in this. Thanks, Butch. Look forward to that. Thank you. Everybody have a good evening. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Good night.